Today we're combining a rock and a log to make a bench or maybe a media console. Haven't really decided yet. The two pieces of wood on either side of the rock came from this mulberry log. Mulberries are pretty hard wood, but it's not typically one used in fine woodworking. This piece was part of a fallen tree that I helped a friend clean up a couple years ago. It's been sitting outside ever since and it's got quite a few big cracks in it. I used my 40 volt chainsaw to split it right down the middle. I am no chainsaw expert, but the battery ones sure have improved a lot. Now that I have two pieces with at least one relatively flat face, I can start carving tapers to either end just to give everything a more fluid and curvy shape. I noticed that the outer perimeter of the wood closest to where the bark was, was a lot softer. So I tried to trim off as much of the pieces that I thought would just be too easily dented. The chainsaw cuts wood really fast and I'm not great at making fluid curved cuts with it. So I switched over to the angle grinder to blend the faceted parts into more fluid curves. Some recent heavy rains caused some erosion and exposed this rock on one of our properties. Rocks like this are not that uncommon out here in Joshua Tree, and this one weighs about 240 pounds. The only strong idea that I had going into this project is that I wanted to use materials that were free, and I liked the idea of wood mushrooms growing out of a rock. At this point, I actually used the video footage to help me design the project. I just hold the pieces up to the rock in different orientations, and then I look at the video footage and figure out what I think has the most potential. The rock is way more stable lying flat, but I think it looks a little more dramatic when it pushes the wood up a little bit higher. The problem here is that that side of the rock isn't as stable and it's a pretty heavy piece to have accidentally fall over. So I'm gonna to try to carve a flat bottom so that this 300 pound piece of furniture can be nice and stable on the floor. My deck isn't that even, so I like to set up a flat surface, and then I used a sharpie to draw a straight line around the perimeter. I'm gonna flatten out this bottom using just an angle grinder. This is one of my favorite tools, and I've used it on metal and wood for a really long time, but in the last six months, I've been learning that I can actually do quite a bit of stone fabrication simply by tracing lines drawn with a sharpie, cutting a bunch of grooves, and chipping pieces out with a hammer or a chisel. Professionals would probably use tools and blades that work wet to keep the dust down but I do have this really nice dust helmet and a lot of people have been asking about it so I'll give a little demo of how it works and what I think about it at the end of the video. So this pretty much is the process. I make some cuts, kind of stand back, look at the lines that I've drawn, chip out the pieces in between the cuts, and whittle the stone down closer to a flat surface. I find that a masonry chisel is just a little bit more precise than a hammer by itself. It was kind of hard to maneuver the angle grinder towards the bottom of the stone, so I just flipped it over and went right back to cutting. I suppose I could use my hammer drill in the hammer only function, but it really doesn't take that much force to knock out these chips. I felt like I was getting reasonably close, but it was hard to tell how flat my surface was. So I took some scrap 2x4s and built a little nest so that I can flip the rock over and really focus on getting that surface nice and flat. For me so far, the most difficult part about working with stone is just the weight and stability. A lot of the time is just spent figuring out how to move things around and get them nice and stable so that I'm setting myself up for successfully transforming organically shaped surfaces into things that are more ready to interface with an architectural environment. I'm using a small level just to keep checking to make sure that I'm not going too far or not far enough. And I had a pretty good starter reference point from that initial perimeter cut that I made. I switched from a segmented cutting blade to this grinding wheel that I really like. And now I'm just gonna smooth out all those rough cut and chipped edges. This may seem really tedious, but I actually thought it was pretty fun. And it only took about five hours. I did this all on New Year's Day. The surface looked pretty flat, so I threw some water on it, and wow, it totally changed the entire appearance. It looked incredible. For a second, I thought about changing the entire design and making this the tabletop, but I'll leave that idea to a future project. Now I'm just using a board to check to see how flat the top is. I look for the high point where the board sort of wobbles, and then just grind that part down a little bit more. And there we go, one nice and stable stone, but it was pretty dirty, so I used this brush attachment just to clean it up with some dish soap. And you may be thinking, well, if you just had a bigger saw blade, you could cut off a nice clean piece and use that for something else. But don't worry, these rock fragments are not going to be wasted. I always need more gravel, and wait till you see how they look after I put them in the rock tumblers. Now that I know the orientation of the rock, I can really focus on carving these lumps of wood. 
My process for this is just holding up the wood to the rock, seeing how it fits, carve away a little more wood, and repeat until I get a nice good fit. The scary part of this project for me is drilling the holes and epoxying in pieces of steel so that the two pieces can come together. I want the wood to be removable so that the piece is easier to move. So I'm going to epoxy steel pipes into the wood and then steel rods into the rock. This way the holes in the wood won't get bigger over time because they're protected by these steel sleeves. But this does mean I need everything to be nice and parallel, otherwise the wood will get stuck. Drilling two parallel holes with a hand drill in organic shapes is not that easy, so I made a little guide to help me. This guide fits around the 3 quarter inch pipes, and I used it to start the holes into the wood. Now I'm just using the marks I made on the side and my eyes to try to keep these holes relatively parallel. I did make them oversized, however, which means I'll be able to adjust the steel pipes a little bit within the holes in the wood. The 5 8 inch rods fit snugly inside the pipes, and if I put another set of pipes over the other ends, I can use the template to hold all the steel pieces roughly parallel. I did need to cut the steel rods down a little bit though, because my initial cuts were too long. I was kind of procrastinating about taking the next step of drilling the holes in stone because that felt so permanent. So I did a little cleanup sanding while I was thinking about it. And then I thought having the steel tubes be a little bit too long would give me a good opportunity to trace their outline onto the stone. And I just wanted to do this so I could do kind of a loose fit before I epoxy anything into anything. So I placed the wood, matched up some lines that I drew on the sides of the pieces, and then traced around the perimeter of the steel pipes coming out of the holes in the wood. The critical skills for projects like this aren't super steady hands or a clear aesthetic vision of nice curvy shapes. It's really steps like this, figuring out how to relay marks from one organic shape to another one so that you can bring the pieces together. But before we drill the holes, let's hear from the sponsor of this video, Factor. This video is sponsored by Factor. Factor's ready-to-eat meal delivery takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success in the new year. Skip the grocery stores, prep work, and cooking for tea. Instead, get chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. With over 35 meals to choose from per week, including options like keto, calorie smart, vegan, and veggie, and more. More, plus over 55 weekly add-ons, you'll have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart your resolutions. Factor meals are fresh, never frozen, and are everything I need for a week full of flavorful, nutritious food. Not only are these meals tasty and nutritionally balanced, they're also really fast. They just take two minutes to microwave or seven minutes in a conventional oven. They also have all the nutritional information right on the label for each meal. When I'm getting ready for a photo shoot that requires me to take my shirt off, I really like pre-proportioned meals like this. Factor does the calorie counting for you, and the food doesn't feel like a compromise. Right now, I've been really busy with the hotel project and running all over the place, and Factor makes sure that I'm eating balanced meals instead of grabbing fast food. So head to factor75.com or click the link below and use the code HOMEMADE50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. That's factor75.com or click the link below and use the code HOMEMADE50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. All right, back to drilling holes in rocks. To drill these holes, I'm gonna actually use my angle grinder. I start with a small diameter abrasive bit, come in at an angle, establish a pilot hole, and then slowly work my way up to a one inch diameter hole. The solid end bits work okay, they take a little while, and the diamond grit on the ends does wear out pretty fast. And I discovered on the second set of holes that the core bits that are hollow work a little bit faster, and then you just sort of chip out the stone core that's left. Now that I have the holes in the stone drilled, I can grind down these pipes so that they're flush with the surface of the wood. To glue these in place, I'm just going to use some Gorilla two-part epoxy. I put tape over the ends because I don't want epoxy to get inside these tubes, otherwise the steel rods won't fit nicely in them. I squirted the epoxy directly in the hole, then used a stick to mix it right inside the hole. I shoved in the steel pipes and saw that I put a little too much epoxy in, had a little bit of overflow, and very quickly tried to wipe everything away so that I wouldn't get any epoxy inside the steel pipes. 
This epoxy only has a five minute setting time, so there's some urgency to this. And it's pretty important to set your phone on silent and have everything ready so you can problem solve and adapt before the epoxy cures. Now I need to set the pipes parallel to each other in the hole. So to do this, I'm just sticking in the steel rods. Then I'm sticking on another set of pipes so that I can put that little spacer over these pipes. And this should keep the pipes in the wood roughly parallel, hopefully close enough. I now have steel pipes securely anchored into the first chunk of wood. The next step is to epoxy the steel rods into the holes in the stone. The one inch diameter holes are way oversized for the 5 8 inch steel rod, but this allows me to fit everything together easily and I'm counting on the anchoring epoxy to fill in the gaps. Now I don't want to get anchoring epoxy on the surface of the stone, so I just rub some Vaseline on it before squirting into quickcrete anchoring epoxy, sticking in the steel rods, and then putting some cellophane or saran wrap over the top just to keep the epoxy from coming out and sticking the wood to the stone. This anchoring epoxy takes about half an hour to fully cure, so I got time to set everything nice and level. I did notice that the outside temperature was only about 40 something degrees, so I got my propane heater, pointed it at the stone, and this brought it up to 70 degrees, which ensures that I'll get a nice good cure with the epoxy. Once everything had cured I pulled the wood off and I used a flap disc on my angle grinder to grind away some of the epoxy that had overflowed the holes. Now I can move on to the orbital sander starting with 60 grit and then working my way up to 150 grit. I was running low on propane so I thought epoxying in the other side would be best done indoors. This time I left the steel rods way too long. This will allow me to actually use the finished wood piece with the pipes already epoxied in there be the guide for these over long rods that are going into the stone. And once it all cured I just trimmed them down and rounded over the edges. Now we can place both pieces and my sister Jessie can take over to do the final round of sanding, bringing everything up to 220 grit. There are some pretty serious cracks and checks in the wood. I got some dentist tools and just used those to kind of clean out all the dust and dirt. I could fill these with epoxy, but I just don't feel like it. The wood seems strong and stable. And since this piece is for me, I don't really mind the cracks. I've done a few projects out of Mulberry and it can come out really orange and very bright. So I'm using Rubio Monaco in white, which will still allow the grain to show through, but it'll just tone down that color saturation of the wood. It's a two part finish, you just mix it together, apply a thick coat, let it sit, and then rub off the excess. Rubio is definitely on the expensive side of wood finishes, but I really didn't spend much on materials for this project, just the steel and the epoxies, so I didn't mind the splurge. I still don't know if I'm going to use this as a media console underneath a wall mounted TV or as a bench for putting on shoes right near the entrance to my new house. But I do know it's going in the new house because I really like sculptural pieces that are one of one to mix in with the more simple plywood furniture and cabinet projects that will fill out the rest of the interiors. I really enjoyed that I didn't have to think too much aesthetically about this project. I just had to sort of follow my intuition and let the materials really drive the uniqueness. No two stones are the same and no two logs are really the same. So if you just work with the shapes you're given with your own little embellishments, you don't have to artificially inject a bunch of flourishes and decorations to create something that's authentically unique. But how does one go about sourcing unique materials? I've been getting these rocks after it rains heavily out in the desert. That rain causes erosion on our dirt roads and driveways, and often you'll see the tips of rocks sticking out afterwards. These are not great for the undercarriage of a car, so I dig them out to save for future projects, and then just fill in the dirt behind them. I also often buy rocks at landscape supply and masonry yards. This mulberry tree fell down a couple years ago and I just cut it up with my chainsaw to use for future projects. I try to preserve the pieces in a variety of different sizes since I don't really know what I'm going to do with them, but it is helpful to have them be movable and small enough that they can somewhat dry out in the sun. Working with free materials is great, but one thing that wasn't free was my 3M VersaFlow Powered Air Purifying Respirator Kit. 
Definitely not a sponsor, I bought mine off of Amazon. And for me, the cost is mostly justified just by how comfortable it is compared to other masks. The filter and fans are based on the belt attachment, and that's where you plug the battery in, and then that goes to a hose to the helmet where air is circulated around, which keeps the mask from fogging up. It works pretty great, and the only thing I don't like about it is that the helmet design makes it really awkward to wear over the ear hearing protection. I'm most often using this contraption when I'm grinding or sanding, and that's also pretty noisy activity, so integrated hearing protection would be a nice addition. This is one of my favorite projects ever. I love that the materials were salvaged. I like that this doesn't require a lot of power tools, although a chainsaw isn't something that everybody has lying around. But most importantly, I think, in a world full of mass production, it's nice to create something that just has to be one of one. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks. Bye.